chapter 36 of volume 3 um, on pre-capitalist relations, Marx discusses how capitalists were able to supersede the land aristocracy because of the relative mobility of their wealth. Um, today we see capitalists trying to acquire lots of land, for example. Bank of America is um, buying foreclosed homes. Uh, what's the relationship here between land, uh, a very grounded form of wealth, uh, and money, an extremely mobile form of wealth? In a capitalist society, uh, money is going to be seeking a rate of return from somewhere. And one of the things that comes up uh, in uh, Volume 3 of Capital a lot is the question of fictitious capital, that is, lending money to somebody for some purpose and getting a rate of return out of that person, even though they're not producing anything, which is why he calls it fictitious, because there's no surplus value. So if I borrow money to buy a house, I pay the bank, you know, 5% or whatever it is, uh, and they get their rate of return, even though I'm not producing any surplus value in my, in my house. One of the ways in which you can start to extract money is, of course, from land, in the form of land rent. Now, we didn't have a chance uh, in, in this class to deal with the question of land rent and its significance, but it's, it's very significant because land is not a commodity in the sense it can be produced. Uh, it is there. You can create an artificial scarcity of it because owners of land withdraw it from production, and so it becomes a speculative form. If society gets into a situation where the rate of return in production is very low, then banking capital tends to go off to these other areas. And one of the things I think we're seeing happening right now is that the rate of return in some of these other areas has been low for the last 20 or 30 years because production has not been that remunerative. It's been highly competitive. What we start to see in society is a, a shifting allocation of, of money capital, looking for the highest rate of return. And if it happens to be in land speculation, why not? And during this, you know, during the, uh, 10 years from 2001 onwards, there was a lot of speculation in, in land and property. And then, of course, the crash occurs. And as people often say, it was a famous uh, uh, saying of the Rothschild bankers. They kind of said, you know, when there's blood on the streets, invest. Mm. And, and so a crash occurs, you know, foreclosures are all over the place. So one of the things that happens is people come in and buy up when things are very depressed and hope that they'll recover in a few years' time. OK, well, this week we've got a lot of uh, materials to look at. Some of it's pretty uh, spiky stuff. Some of it's very obscure stuff. Some of it's uh, sort of uh, not quite sure what's going on stuff. Uh, my, my plan here is not to try and do a definitive reading on it, but try and touch, touch on some of the main points and to try then to use that as a background when we go back into Volume 2 uh, for what the Volume 2 materials are talking about. Now, the, the, the chapters here, after starting off with talking about the role of credit in general, then talking about the banking system and some characteristics of the banking system, and then talking about the dynamics and then finally getting into all kinds of aspects of you know, banking legislation and all, all that other stuff, which is very difficult to figure out what Marx's opinion was. Um, but as I think happens in some of the earlier stuff, I think it's important to look at some threads and some flows which occur uh, in his thinking. And there are two threads I would like to, to start with. Uh, the first is that he made the comment in an earlier chapter that the credit system starts to operate as the common capital of the class. And it seems to me these chapters are very much about what happens uh, when what was seen earlier as kind of just individual capitalists using capital and you know, producing and all this kind of stuff, that, that it suddenly gets turned into a common capital of the class, particularly through uh, the rise of uh, joint stock companies and all the rest of it. And uh, uh, we want to talk a little bit about that because, in a way, he sees these as, uh, and it's, it may look strange to us today, but I think we should think about it, he sees these as some transitional form 
into another mode of production. And I think uh, one of the big questions that arises is uh, what uh, transitional possibilities uh, exist there. And he has this uh, wonderful kind of uh, expression when he talks about uh, the banker in Second Empire Paris, uh, Isaac Perrer. In fact, there was Emile Perrer as well, the brothers, uh, who, uh, as he says, they, they had the, the nicely mixed character of uh, swindler and prophet. And, and I think that sort of uh, set of possibilities that exists uh, here is, I think, something that we need to look at. Now, when it comes to uh, uh, Isaac and Emile uh, Perrer, um, they're interesting characters, and he talks a little bit about them in the history chapter. And uh, I came across them at, at ad nauseam, almost, uh, when I was writing about Second Empire Paris. And they, they were... Uh, two brothers who were, who were heavily influenced in, in their youth by the thinking of Saint-Simon, and they belonged to a Saint-Simonian sect uh, in the 1830s. And Saint-Simon was a, a kind of utopian thinker, dreamer of uh, how to construct uh, alternative societies. Many people would regard him as a conventional utopian thinker, but I think that's not quite right. And Saint-Simon uh, did what many thinkers of that sort used to do in that day. He would try and give advice to statesmen, and, and, and he was constantly sending letters to the king, long ex explanations as to why the king should do this or do that, and, and suggested a lot of things, which I think uh, were very interesting for the time. For example, uh, he was one of the first people that I know of who thought that the idea of uh, uh, a united Europe was a good idea. And that uh, actually, uh, if you look at the European Union and you kind of, kind of say that's a realization of the San Simonian project. Uh, and he had other things about you know, what the king should do in terms of the organization of society. In much the same way that Adam Smith, uh, you know, people think Adam Smith wasn't, you know, was just writing for the general public. In fact, he was really writing for statesmen. Uh, to try to influence them in terms of their, of their public policies, and San Simon was doing the same. And towards the end, one of some of his last publications, he started to get very explicit uh, about capital labor relations. And so, to some people, particularly in the later period, he was uh, really being looked at as a utopian thinker who was trying to bring workers into a very specific relation uh, to. Uh, uh, the general dynamics of a, of a developing capitalist society. But for him, workers were very much defined as artisans. They were not, uh, as it were, factory workers. It was more about you know, how to, the artisan class could be brought in uh, to, to this world. And in the midst of this, he also thought that uh, associate, the association of capitals would be a fantastic idea. He saw a tremendous amount of waste, you know, little dribs of capital all around here, there, and everywhere. They put it all together. And he was very, very excited about the idea of vast public works and huge kind of uh, programmatic uh, transformations. Uh, and uh, for that reason, San Simon was very enthusiastic uh, about the idea of the coming of the railroads and building railroads and, and building huge kind of infrastructures. And this would take, he argued, a collective capital, associated capital, and so he started to say we should have institutions uh, which uh, associate capital and then engage in the big public works for the public good. Now, when... Uh, uh, Louis Napoleon came to power, uh, first uh, elected president, and then he uh, coup d'etat and he declared himself uh, emperor in uh, 1852. He was faced with a real problem of how to put capital and labor back to work after the Great Depression of 1847-48 that Marx is to some degree talking about here. And one of the answers was big public works. Uh, and uh, eventually, of course, this was going to lead into all sorts of things like the construction of the Suez Canal, uh, building of the railroad, and the building of the railroad networks throughout, uh, throughout Europe. 
uh, and it was, uh, but, but just building the public works required dissociation of capital. So what happened was that the Pereres kind of said, well, that's a great idea, we're now going to set up these new banks and these new institutions, which are going to be credit institutions, uh, and that's what they did. And, and of course they found very soon that this allowed them to monopolize a lot of uh, activities, the, uh, the, 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 the transit structures in Paris, all this sort of thing, so they became bankers of uh, the era. But they got into a huge fight and in the Second Empire with the Rothschilds. And, and this is relevant to Marx's text because uh, he could well have had uh, them in mind when, when he, there's this little snippet on page 727. He says, the monetary system is essentially Catholic, the credit system essentially Protestant, the Scotch hate gold. As paper, the monetary existence of commodities has a purely social existence. It is faith that brings salvation. Faith in money value as the imminent spirit of commodities. Faith in the mode of production as predestined disposition. Faith in the individual agents of production as mere personifications of self-valorizing capital. But the credit system is no more emancipated from the monetary system as its basis, and Protestantism is from the foundations of Catholicism. What this means is, if you put your faith in paper money, uh, you've got to have a lot of faith in it. Whereas if you hold gold, you've got a real commodity which has a real value. And, and the conflict between the Rothschilds was, was between Rothschild believing in, in gold was, was what it was about, and Rothschild controlled all the gold, the Pereres were into the paper money. And when the crash came in 1867, the Pereres went bankrupt and Rothschild gleefully helped them go bankrupt because he controlled the gold. And this is the point that, about, that, that Marx is getting at here. And this, of course, uh, then goes more systemically, and this is something also you wouldn't have read for this week, but so I'm going to point it out to you because it is a conf confirmation of this, this way of thinking, which is back on 706. We have also ignored the function of the metal reserve as the guarantee for the convertibility of banknotes and as the pivot of the entire credit system. The central bank is the pivot of the credit system and the metal reserve is in turn the pivot of the bank. It is inevitable that the credit system should collapse into the monetary system, as I already showed back in Volume 1, Chapter 3. A certain quantity, then goes on a few lines, a certain quantity of metal that is insignificant in comparison with the production as a whole is the acknowledged pivot of the system. And right to the bottom of the page, 707, he says, credit being similarly a social form of wealth, displaces money and usurps its position. It is confidence in the social character of production that makes the money form of products appear as something merely evanescent and ideal, as a mere notion. But as soon as credit is shaken, and this is a regular and necessary phase in the cycle of modern industry, all real wealth is supposed to be actually and suddenly transformed into money, into gold and silver. A crazy demand, but one that necessarily grows out of the system itself. And he says, then the gold and silver that is supposed to satisfy these immense claims amounts in all to a few millions in the vaults of the bank. So then, further down the page, within the capitalist system, the most striking gross, grotesque form of this absurd contradiction and paradox arises because one, in the capitalist system production for direct use value for the producer's own use is most completely abolished, so that wealth exists only as social process expressed as the entwinement of production and circulation, and two, because with the de development of the credit system, capitalist production constantly strives to overcome this metallic barrier, which is both a material and an imaginary barrier to wealth and its movement while time and again breaking its head on it. Now, one of the themes which is, I think, a very difficult theme for everybody, uh, all analysts, to, to d grapple with, uh, including Marx, is what's the relationship between, you know, one well, this country is called Wall Street and Main Street, or in Britain is called uh, the city and the high street. What's the relationship between the, the monetary stuff and the, quote, the real economy? This is, that kind of question is constantly being posed. 
And I think what you see in Marx's account of the credit system is that to the degree that the monetary base operates as some sort of barrier to the expansionary push, and if you like, the, 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 the necessary speculative push, to the degree that the, the monetary system acts as a, a barrier, so the credit system becomes crucial uh, to the expansion of capitalism. And, and therefore you cannot do without it. So he's kind of, I think that's the, one of the main thrusts of his argument in, in, in these chapters. But as it does so, then the question of what, what the relationship of all of that credit froth is to real production gets posed again and again and again. And sometimes nobody notices everything sort of, you know, and during the asset bubble of 2005, 2006, nobody noticed. You had a house and suddenly the, the, the paper value of it had gone up and, oh wow, you know, draw some more money out, it's fun, you know, I mean, it's great. Oh, it's gone up further, I'll draw out some more money, you know. And, and everybody thinks everything's fine and things are going to go up forever and then all of a sudden somebody says, where's the money, where's the real value, and then suddenly the thing goes boom. And, 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 and the liquidity dries up and everybody says, where's the gold? So what, what Marx is saying, I think, is that the disciplinary apparatus that connects Main Street with, with Wall Street is, is the money commodity, the tangible mon monetary commodity, gold. That is his argument. Now, what we see in these chapters is, is the credit system perpetually bursting out of the, of the barriers of, of, of accumulation. And as it does so, of course, you're dealing with the limitlessness of money accumulation, potential limitlessness of it. You can create as much money as you want by IOUs and all the rest of it. We're creating money all of the time. So that is going on. But then there's this kind of question of how the reality check works. Now this analysis that he has poses, I think, a very particular kind of problem for our own particular situation because uh, the, the, the monetary system of the world was demetallicized in, in, in the early 1970s, formally so, I think, in 1973. So the global financial system no longer has a metallic base in any formal sense, but you can see when you start to look at what happens to gold prices that actually it, the metallic, you know, a lot of people who believe in the metallic base and kind of saying, and, and there are plenty of people around, you know, including some people on the far right who kind of say we should get back onto the gold standard, you know. But the problem with getting back on the gold standard, as, as Marx is I think correctly pointing out, is if you get back on the gold standard and you rigidly adhere to it, the expansionary capacities of the system are going to be blocked. So you can't go back onto the gold standard, and if we did, it would be a disaster. I mean, and I think most, most people would now kind of accept that, apart from the, the people called the gold bugs, who kind of say we've got to get back on the gold standard. Which then says, well, what's the substitute in our society for this reality check? And the other theme that comes out here is, well, the substitute in the end, in Marx's case, is the Bank of England. Or, in our case, the Federal Reserve. In other words, we've got rid of the metallic base, but now we've got a system of global central bankers who, in coordination with each other, are, are trying actually to sort of keep some sort of, some sort of lid on or should, they should be trying to keep some sort of lid uh, on, on the speculative uh, aspects of, of, of capital accumulation. And here, uh, too, we, we find Marx saying something which is, I think, terribly important, that if, if you're looking for an institutional base, if you take this phrase where, where he says um, uh, the, you know, the central bank is the pivot of the credit system, and the metal reserve is in turn the pivot of the bank, if you wipe out the metal reserve as the pivot of the bank, then you're left with the central bank as the pivot in itself. And the question then is, is a human institution and is it going to do the right thing? How do they know to do the right thing? Now with gold, that's not, that's not a question in that way. And so you have, then have to ask some questions about how are central banks structured 
and, and how the central banks make decisions in order to sort of deal with this kind of question as to what's the relationship between the credit system and its monetary base. And here again Marx has, I think, some acute observations, which are that if, if the central bank is badly structured in some way, uh, or if they're working with the wrong economic theory, as many people say ben Bernanke is, and, and the rest of the Federal Reserve governors are, and if, for example, you have a European central bank which is mandated to control inflation, but is not mandated to do anything whatsoever about unemployment, then, then you get a certain bias in the way in which the, the central bank works and it doesn't necessarily end up doing the right things. And Marx's example, which crops up several times, which you may have noticed, was he keeps on going back to this Bank Act that was, you know, of, of 1844, that was, that was erroneous. Now, why was it erroneous? Well, he, he explains it, and the, and the best explanation of it is on page 688, where he gives a very nice little description of the problems of the central bank. The 1844 Bank Act divides the Bank of England into an issue department and a banking department. And then he goes on in the next uh, page to talk about the fact that a f there was a firewall between them. Now the issue department was a department that issued notes in exchange for gold. So if I had gold, some gold sovereigns, I'd take them into the bank and say, give me some notes, because I'd rather have notes rather than going around with these bits of gold, you know. Give me some notes. And the note would say, uh, I promise to pay to the bearer on presentation, uh, you know, two guineas or ten guineas or ten pounds or whatever. <coughs> so I could take gold into the bank and I could get notes for it. Uh, at any time, I could go to the bank with my notes and get the gold back. Uh, and this allowed, so the bank of issue was issuing its own notes in relation to its own gold reserves. So it has some gold reserves and, and sufficient gold reserves so that anybody came and said, you know, if a sudden a bunch of people came and said, hey, I want, I want to have gold because uh, I want to take it to Germany or somewhere, then, you know, the bank would just give them the gold. So this is the bank of issue. The main bank was doing what banks generally do, which is to discount uh, checks and, and bills of, of you know uh, bills of exchange and and and, and issue uh, bonds and, and all kinds of things. So it's doing the rest of the bank business. Now there's a firewall between these two. And what happened in 1848 in, in Marx's account is that the banking part suddenly people got nervous about paper. Now you know all these IOUs, and they came and, and, and kind of said, well, I don't like these IOUs, give me some gold. So there was, there was gold reserves in the banking part too, so you could get gold there too. But, but people started to kind of say, well, we don't trust these notes, I want, I want hard cash. And, so, and, and suddenly the banking department ran out of cash. It ran out of gold. But since there was a firewall between them and the other department, the other department had lots of gold, and the banking department ran out. Now, if it ran out, uh, then there would have been an even greater panic. So, so there was, there was, there was a, 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 an even greater panic going on because they seemed to be running out of gold, and so they had to suspend the Bank Act to say, okay, we can take all that gold which exists in the issue department and we can shove it over here and you can, you know, so they had to suspend the Bank Act twice, it turned out, in the space of three years. Now, if you have an institution that doesn't work in a crisis, then what kind of institution is that? And Marx is kind of saying it was bad. Now, be, let, let's be clear, Marx does not say at any point that the bad design of the 1844 Bank Act caused a crisis. He doesn't say that at all. What he says is that in the crisis, a bad Bank Act exacerbated it, made it worse. And there are many people who look at the history of, say, the Federal Reserve and ask questions about to what degree did the Federal Reserve by its policies make something worse? And we're right in that case right now. I mean, people are asking that kind of question. If, 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 the, if the Federal Reserve does not go into another round of quantitative easing, for example, which is a way of providing a great deal of liquidity into the economy, if it stops doing that, as some of the hawks in the bank are saying they should do, for fear of inflation, if they stop doing that, then 
the, the, the liquidity which they've been pumping in over the last two or three years will dry up, and to the degree that there's been any stimulus in the economy right now, it has a lot to do with the liquidity they've been pumping in, because Congress isn't doing it because they're against the stimulus programs, because all the Republicans are saying, ah, no, you can't do that, we're not allowing you to do that. So the only form of stimulus that really exists is, is through Federal Reserve. Now if the Federal Reserve decides against, uh, and probably there's pressure from the Republicans to, to, to do that, and to the degree that Bernanke is a Republican, he may listen to it, to, to, that, to that degree. So we move from a situation where we have a commodity base to it all to a human decision-making base. And I think that's been the situation since 1973. That just taking that <coughs> neat little kind of formulation, that the central bank is the pivot of the credit system and the gold base is the pivot of the central bank, take away that pivot, you're left with something that pivots on its own. So this is again a, a, a way in which to start to think about the relationship between Wall Street and Main Street, that the, the, the regulator in the end is going to be uh, the, you know, is, is, is the central bank, that's what, what, we're, what we're faced with, with of course those people who are very, very nervous about central bank policy actually investing in gold. So or gold prices have gone up, where are they now? Something like $1,500 an ounce, something like that, getting towards there. Some people are predicting that in the next few years it'll go up to $5,000 an ounce, so get into it quick, go, on, go out and buy a few. So the gold bugs are advertising, get your gold now because you know, you're soon going to need it. And, and, and they may be right, you see, I mean, you know, I'll kick myself in five years if it has gone to $5,000 an ounce, you know, you go, well, but, so this is, this is a, so, so Marx, is, it seems to me, has, has, has laid out a way of thinking about this, which I find, find you know, extremely, extremely useful. But it gets back, I mean, when you, when you look at the, some of the craziness he talks about within the credit system, and, you know, the stock exchange, uh, the sharks and the wolves and the, you know, and the ghastly kind of speculative kind of stuff, you kind of say, why on earth does any society tolerate it? But I think the answer is also coming back very, very, very quickly, that the dynamics of the society require that you break through the barriers which are posed by the restrictions of the monetary base. Because the monetary base and it's restri is restricted, you know, simply by the fact, as he says, that, that at any one moment within the banking system the amount of gold there is there cannot possibly cover all of the transactions that are going on. And, and, and if, if, if it had to, we would, have, we would have frozen the whole of capitalism down into a very low rate of growth, which may or may not have been, been a good thing, but we would be living in a different kind of society uh, if uh, we had done that. So that's one of the, the threads that goes on here, and of course it involves these bits and, 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 and pieces, which I think are, are kind of interesting. Um, and the Pereres, of course, were those who burst through, if you like, the, the restraints of the monetary base. And while they went bankrupt in 1867, you can kind of say, ah, oh, well, see, what a disaster. On the other hand, by then, the Parisian boulevards were built. You know, the, you go see the infrastructure of Paris, the sewers and the subway, uh, and the sewers and the, and, and the water systems were built. And you go to Paris right now and you see what was done by associated capitals, and it was the Pereres that associated the capitals to do it. And this is one of the ironies of this form of investment, that it, it monetarily goes bankrupt, but you're left with the physical asset. So much of what you see in Paris right now was a product of what the Pereres did. Rothschild would not do it. You know, the Pereres did it. And, and, and this then sort of raises, again, some interesting kind of questions of what our attitude should be. Now, for those of you who are kind of interested in, in uh, the Perez, uh, Zola wrote a fantastic novel called Money, which is about the battle between Rothschild and, and the Perez. And, and one of the things that, uh, I mean, there are plenty of descriptions in here about, you know, what the what these speculators are like, but actually uh, I think Zola does it uh, one step so just out of fun, I thought I'd read you some of Zola's descriptions about how these people think. Uh, the, the, 
the Pereira figure is, uh, is a man called uh, Saccard. And he's often in dialogue with a cousin of his, a woman cousin, who's rather demure and gentle and, 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 and thoughtful and, and, and everything. And she's very nervous about what he's doing because he's building these vast speculative activities. And so he keeps on trying to persuade her and that uh, everything is... Uh, uh, so here's what he says to her. He says, Look here, cries Saccard, you will behold a complete resurrection over all these depopulated plains, these deserted passes which our railways will traverse. Yes, fields will be cleared, roads and canals built, new cities will spring from the soil. Life will return as it returns to a sick body when we stimulate the system by injecting new blood into exhausted veins. Yes, money will work these miracles. You must understand that speculation, gambling, is the central mechanism, the heart itself of a vast affair like ours. Yes, it attracts blood, takes it from every source in little streamlets, collects it, sends it back in rivers in all directions, and establishes an enormous circulation of money which is the very life of great enterprises. Speculation, why it is the one inducement that we have to live. It is the eternal desire that compels us to live and struggle. Without speculation, my dear friend, there would be no business of any kind. It is the same as in love. In love as in speculation there is much filth. In love also people think only of their own gratification, yet without love there will be no life and the world will come to an end. Now, you can understand how the masters of the universe down on Wall Street really get off on the world on, you know, in this kind of vein. Well, she's eventually seduced by this uh, kind of uh, going on. She, she, she starts to think about it, about how uh, actually you, you do change the world by these, by these speculative activities, as the Perez did in Paris. Uh, and, and so she starts to get her own vision about this and she she's sort of starts to be attracted into it, seduced into it. And her love of life, her ever buoyant hopefulness, filled her with enthusiasm at the idea of the all-powerful magic wand with which science and her speculation would strike this old sleeping soil and suddenly reawaken it. She saw this rising again, the forward irresistible march, the social impulse towards the greatest possible sum of happiness, the need of action, of going ahead without knowing exactly whither. And amid it all there was a globe turned upside down by the ant swarm, rebuilding its abode, its work never ending, fresh sources of enjoyment ever being discovered, man's power increasing tenfold, the earth belonging to him more and more every day, money aiding science yielded progress. And then she goes on to say, money was the dung heap that nurtured the growth of tomorrow's humanity. Without speculation there would be no vibrant and fruitful undertakings any more than there could be children without lust. It took this excess of passion, all this contemptibly wasted and lost life, to ensure the continuation of life. Money, the poisoner and destroyer, was becoming the seedbed for all forms of social growth. It was the manure needed to sustain the great public works whose execution was bringing the peoples of the globe together and pacifying the earth. Everything that was good came out of that which was evil. It's wonderful passages about, about, about the, you know, the, the, the speculative side of, of, of what is going on under capitalism and, of course, you know, Zola's connecting it with sexual desire and mastery and all these other th kinds, of, kinds of aspects. And I think it's a... But I think, it, you know, we, again, one of the things we, we have to understand about the speculation, well, you know, obviously you can pull back from it, but you've got to be careful because the speculative urge is, is, is the one that makes things. It's the exploration of the new. And indeed, it takes a certain guts to, 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 to go for it. And, and in some ways, it is the, 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 the attractiveness of the entrepreneur, and Marx has some comments in here about how, uh, you know, when, when, when all of this speculative fever collapses, uh, the entrepreneur goes into hiding. They, they can't be found anymore. And, and if you lose the entrepreneurial spirit, where is capitalism, where is growth, where is development? And so there's a very complex kind of uh, relationship, uh, I think, that arises between not only uh, you know, Main Street and Wall Street, but a very complicated relationship that arises between you know, this idea of progress and, 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 and development and change, uh, which then, of course, uh, is, is then going to be taken up uh, l later on in, in this whole kind of argument that Marx starts to lay out uh, about the way in which associated capitals can be a precursor uh, of not only of associated capital but also associated labor uh, moving into and, and the creation of an alternative mode of production through uh, the development of associated labor.
Let me go very briefly to, to chapter 36, which I suggested you may want to read first, which is the pre-capitalist uh, relations, page 728 uh, onwards. Now, the first part of this is really taken up with the uh, discussion and a description of the history of usury. Uh, but Marx, several times in Capital, including if you go to, to volume one of Capital, um, I've forgotten exactly where it is, but I can tell you, where, where Marx uses this idea that, that interest is the part of the, oh, page 267 of volume one, uh, Marx talks about the way in which interest-bearing capital uh, and, and its twin brother merchant's capital are what he calls the anti-diluvian forms of capital which long precede the capitalist mode of production and are to be found in the most diverse socio-economic formations. Now notice here that capital exists before a capitalist mode of production. Now he's raised the issue you know, in, in volume two, that, that commodity has to exist before, uh, exchange of labor for services uh, for money has to exist before, commodification has to exist before, but now he's even saying capital exists before. But it, it does, has not achieved, and this is consistent with his account in volume one, it has not achieved its distinctive mode of production. And in many ways, Volume 1 is an account of how capital came to discover its distinctive mode of production, particularly in the rise of, of machine tool industry and machinery and the factory system and all the rest of it. So, so capital pre-exists, it, but it, it pre-exists in these forms. And without going uh, into to too much detail here, uh, obviously usury is about extracting money which is a form of social power, you know, using this formulation, appropriable by private persons, using that social power in certain ways. Uh, one of the ways in which it's used is to create, create a hoard of that social power. But the usurer doesn't maintain that hoard, with, they, they continue to use the money power to lend out to people, and this has certain consequences. What usury does, he says, is, is it has uh, a, a dual function in, in, in the history. Uh, the first is in relation, as he says on 729 in the middle there, ruining the rich landed proprietors. And the second is by the impoverishment of the small producers. And in particular, of course, the destruction of peasant uh, populations through, uh, through usury. And uh, so he then discusses the relationship between those uh, two classes and what happens to them. Uh, and it, in effect, what he's, what he's really talking about here is, is a, a certain aspect which was talked about in Volume 1, which is the use of usury to complete the process of primitive accumulation. He doesn't call that primitive accumulation here, but that's really what's, what's going on. Uh, but his objections to usury are that the usurer does not actually use the capital, the, 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 the capital they amass for the transformation of the mode of production. In fact, they do exactly the opposite. Uh, as he says at the bottom of 730, usurer's capital impoverishes the mode of production cripples the productive forces instead of developing them, and simultaneously perpetuates these lamentable conditions in which the social productivity of labor is not developed even at the cost of the worker himself, as it is in capitalist production. So usury undermines the power of feudal classes. It amasses capital out of the destruction of peasant proprietors and, and, and the like. Uh, and, and he then talks about all kinds of, uh, he says, uh, 731, where the means of production are fragmented, usury centralizes monetary wealth. It does not change the mode of production, but clings on to it like a parasite and impoverishes it. It sucks dry, emasculates it, and forces reproduction to proceed under ever more pitiable conditions. Hence the popular hatred of usury at its peak in the ancient world. And this this uh, notion then becomes one that 
uh, he then carries forward through the Roman Empire, uh, through the Middle Ages, uh, and as he says on 732, usury has a revolutionary effect on pre-capitalist modes of production only insofar as it destroys and dissolves the forms of ownership which provide a firm basis for the articulation of political life and whose constant reproduction in the same form is a necessity for that life. And then towards the bottom of the page, final paragraph, usurer's capital has capital's mode of exploitation without its mode of production. And then right at the bottom, usury is historically important in contrast to wealth devoted entirely to consumption as being itself a process giving rise to capital. Usurer's capital and mercantile wealth bring about the formation of a monetary wealth independent of landed property. Now, the interesting thing here is about monetary power versus landed power. Landed power is fixed in place. Monetary power is highly mobile. I mean, I made this point, you know, money is the sort of butterfly form of capital, it can flit around. And what you have is a relationship between something that's fixed and something that's mobile. And what generally happens in that situation is whoever has the greater mobility wins. And to the degree that uh, the usurers and the mercantile interests had the greater mobility, so they were able to undermine entirely the power of landed property. So he goes on in this kind of vein, and, and, and it, it's not too hard to read, so I'm not going to sort of cite it in any detail. But then he contrasts usury uh, with the credit system, and this begins on page 735 at the top. He says, the credit system develops as a reaction against usury, but this should not be misconstrued, nor by any means taken in the sense of the ancient writers, the fathers of the church, Luther, or the early socialists. It means neither more nor less than the subordination of interest-bearing capital to the conditions and requirements of the capitalist mode of production. That is, usury is a pioneer of assembling the capital, but at some point or other it has to be disciplined uh, to perform a function within the capitalist mode of production. It has to become, in some sense, a subordinate. Now this is a very interesting kind of, kind of argument, because the subordination of interest-bearing capital to the capitalist mode of production, is then, as you go through the text and you see what's happening, you see actually it, it, it escapes that subordination, in a way, and starts to become a power unto itself over the capitalist mode of production. So this relationship is, is in here is, 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 is to me a, a, very, a very complicated one, because on the one hand it's subordinate, on the other hand it's dominant, which is when it operates as the common capital of the class, it starts to become dominant. So, so there's, a, there's a very, very historically, I'm not quite sure exactly how to uh, figure this. But he says, in, a bit further on 735, in the modern credit system, interest-bearing capital becomes adapted on the whole to the conditions of capitalist production. But he then says, usury proper, proper not only continues to exist, but in countries of developed capitalist production, it is freed from the barriers that former legislation had always placed to it. Now, even in our society, there, these two words, interest and usury, are different from each other. And uh, I don't know whether this is true here, but in the state of Maryland, there are anti-usury laws, which are not anti-interest laws. And the usury laws are applied to the pawn shops and, you know, the Okay. And, 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 and if you can find people who are engaging in usurious practices, you can, you know, so the, the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a funny line between usury in our society, a funny line between usury and interest. I mean, you might actually, I, I fantasize sometimes in the state of Maryland, they will go after the banks for charging so much on credit cards, kind of say this is a usurious rate and that therefore, that, you know, they should be all thrown in jail for being usurers rather than, you know, gaining, gaining interest in a legitimate way. And of course, that was one of the things that Luther said, well, there's a fair rate of interest versus usury, and so that, that's one of the distinctions that, uh, that did come in, in, into the picture. This is further down on that page. What distinguishes interest-bearing capital, insofar as it forms an essential element of the capitalist mode of production from usurer's capital, is in no way the nature or character of this capital itself, it is simply the changed conditions under which it functions, 
and hence also the totally transformed figure of the borrower who confronts the moneylender. And the borrower, of course, becomes the capitalist uh, producer. And then there comes an interesting kind of thing that, uh, and this fact is so very much admired by the economic apologists that a man without wealth but with energy, determination, ability, and business acumen can transform himself into a capitalist in this way. Uh, and then talks about uh, that all of this actually reinforces the rule of capital itself, widens its basis, and enables it to recruit ever new forces from the lower strata of society. The way that the Catholic Church of the Middle Ages built its hierarchy out of the best brains in the nation without regard to status, birth, or wealth was likewise a major means of reinforcing the rule of the priests and suppressing the laity. The more a dominant class is able to absorb the best people from the dominated classes, the more solid and dangerous its rule is. A very interesting idea. Okay, you've got to liberate things for the entrepreneur. And one of the ways the credit system does that is to kind of say, you know, and I guess that's what microfinance is trying to do, right? And, and everything else. So, so you go off and sort of, yeah, try and try and make everybody an entrepreneur, and then entrepreneurs come out, and 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 you know, a million of them fail, and one of them succeeds, and and of course their story gets told in the New York Times. What happens to the other? You know, everybody else is is forgotten. But the grand story, or the rags to riches story, becomes possible because you know you can borrow you know twenty five dollars and start doing something, and then you can borrow fifty dollars and then a thousand dollars and suddenly. So the credit system, but but it's a very interesting point Marx is making. The credit system opens up some possibilities for entrepreneurial activity in ways that are blocked in more conventional societies, and that could be one of the strengths of a capitalist system. I have to be careful here. I, I'm always being accused of actually lauding the, the, the capitalist system of how, how, how clever it is. But it is clever, you know, and, 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 and it seems to me it's, it, it's, it's ridiculous to deny its, its, its capacity to mobilize innovative activities and its capacity uh, to, to do, you know, to build Paris, for example. You know, and I kind of like uh, Second Empire Paris, what's left of it, you know. So. And then he talk, starts to talk about the growth of this credit system, and he talks about the credit associations, which were characteristic of Venice and Genoa, uh, and uh, the banks, and so on, and that they started to become involved uh, in public credit, from which the state received advances, and this is on 737, against taxes anticipated. So you start to lend to the state. And notice here, there's something very interesting. It should not be forgotten that the merchants who formed these associations were themselves the most prominent people in those states, and were equally interested in emancipating both their government and themselves from usury, while at the same time subordinating the state more securely to themselves. Now here you've got a very interesting relationship which Marx is pointing to, which is the relationship between state debt and those people who hold the debt. And, and is, this a way, is this a way, and right now, what do we see? What's the power of the bondholders in relationship to the state debt of Portugal or Ireland or Greece? It's huge. They can discipline those states. The bondholders can discipline them. Now, will the bondholders, you know, this is a fantasy in the newspaper, will the bondholders ever discipline the United States? Has anyone seen this, this ad uh, which, which has people speaking in Chinese? Have you seen it? I've only seen it once. It's just come out. It's, it's, it's sort of black and white and it's rather sinister and some guy with a thing saying, well, you know, great empires fall, Rome fell, uh, British Empire fell, and of course the last empire just consumed and went into debt. And this is all said in Chinese so you get subtitles. There's a big audience there and they're kind of going, yeah. And, uh, and then he kind of says, and so he ends up kind of saying, so now, and, the, and it's set in 2030 or something like that, and then he kind of says, so now they work for us, and everybody in the audience goes, ha, ah, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. And, and, and this is the right wing, you know, this is a real, I mean, this, this is a horrible, horrible ad in all kinds of ways. I mean, it, take the kind of yellow peril, narrative and make it big again, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it, it, but at the same time it's, it's, it, it's about the complicated relationship between the bondholders and, 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 and state power.
And if you take the view that the bondholders have uh, power over the state, but the interesting thing here is that Marx is kind of saying actually the people who lent the money were the state in a way. So, so you know, I, I prefer to talk about the, the formation of a state finance nexus, and there's some terrific literature now uh, by economic historians on the formation of what they call the fiscal military state in the 16th and 17th century. And the fiscal military state is, a, it, you know, is very much Marx is kind of talking about that here. And I, so I find this, this, this stuff very interesting. And then he talks about Bank of uh, Amsterdam. Uh, and, and, you know, for those of you who are familiar with Giovanni Righi's work, you'll recognize this notion of hegemonic shift from, from Genoa and Venice uh, and its financing to Amsterdam, the Low Countries, uh, and, and, and what went on in, in Holland. Uh, and uh, he talks at the bottom there of the 737, right throughout the 18th century, we hear the cry for a compulsory reduction in the interest rate with reference being made to Holland, and legislation proceeds in the same direction. The aim being to subordinate interest-bearing capital to commercial and industrial capital instead of vice versa. So there was a struggle against usury, it just wasn't simply displaced. Uh, but then there came the question in, in Britain, which, uh, which is who, who controls the credit system. And the stuff I mentioned earlier is, I think, very much uh, involved here. Because there's the Bank of England and the goldsmiths. Okay. So, in a way, the goldsmiths were the, gold, were the, were the, were the people who were, you know, in a way, the, the pivot, if you like. And they didn't want the Bank of England getting in the way of their business with everybody. They didn't want the Bank of England mediating between them and everybody else. So they're resisting the formation of the Bank of England. Uh, and the Bank of England has to deal with the power of the goldsmiths, because gold is the monetary basis, of the, is the pivot upon which the Bank of England rests. So there's a very interesting little historical uh, piece of the argument I was early making, earlier making about the monetary base and, and the credit system. And then, of course, uh, there, there is the, the story of the formation of the Bank of England uh, and, and the San Simonians then come up, and so uh, 740 to 741 he starts talking about the way in which the San Simonians and the, the, the Perea doesn't, he mentions Emile Perea here, not um, Isaac. Uh, so he talks about uh, the uh, them, but then comes back again, as, 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 as I've mentioned a few times already, at the bottom of 741, it must never be forgotten, however, firstly, that money in the form of precious metal remains the foundation from which the credit system can never break free. Well, the never has to be qualified right now, because it has broken free, uh, by the very nature of the case, he says. Secondly, that the credit system presupposes the monopoly possession of the social means of production in the form of capital and landed property on the part of private individuals, that it is itself on the one hand an immanent form of the capitalist mode of production, and on the other hand a driving force of its development into its highest and poss last possible form. I was in a discussion the other night with some uh, uh, Indian Marxists and uh, Pat Naik, a very, very smart guy, uh, was kind of saying that in his view he thought we had arrived at the point where the immanent relation uh, between money and the state had become so connected to, if you like, the trajectory of capitalist development that it was becoming increasingly difficult to imagine an independent state power that would be able to step back and actually do something to, to really regulate it. And you can see that, I think, in, in the Financial Reform Act of last year, I mean, it was written by bankers, I mean, they, they, they conceded a little bit, and now they're trying to undermine it all the way. So, so I in a sense, this immanent form of capitalist mode of production, I think that's a very interesting phrase uh, that we might want to apply to the present circumstances. It was the one that he applied the other night, and I had, when I was thinking about it, I was saying, well, you know, yeah, but well, you have to think about it uh, in that way. But don't necessarily think about it as if somehow or other the state is not is is is, is simply a, a a tool. As I mean, I think we go into discussion about that. Do you, does this mean the state is simply a tool of capital, or does it mean that something else is formed 
which is a fusion of state and, and, and capital, which has a different, rather different trajectory in what it's about. And I suspect it, it, it probably is. And if you kind of ask me about the, the forms of governance that are likely to arise out of this, uh, there are some think tanks now that are saying basically we should all get like China and we should have an elite who decide everything and not let democracy, uh, you know, it's an anti-democratic, or, or authoritarian, or to autocratic form of governance. Uh, and, and so I, I think this whole kind of question of what's the relationship between state and, 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 and financial power, not capital so much as uh, the producer capital, but financial power, what's the relationship, particularly since so much of what the, the, the financiers do is trade in state debt. And they are the state, so, trying, so it's, it's, it, it's kind of an, an interesting relation, and I think Marx is, is posing that here. Uh, but again, what we, what we see in, this, in, the, in the passages that then follow is that uh, you can't do without uh, the full development of the credit and the banking system. In other words, it's, it's, it's not an option, it's a necessary condition. So as he says, uh, about two-thirds down to 742, the social character of capital is mediated and completely realized only by the full development of the credit and banking system. The credit system thereby abolishes the private character of capital and thus inherently bears within it, though only inherently, the, the abolition of capital itself. Banking and credit, however, thereby also become the most powerful means for driving capitalist production beyond its own barriers, and one of the most effective vehicles for crises and swindling. And then he comes down to this stuff about the, the end. That finally, there can be no doubt that the credit system will serve as a powerful lever in the course of transition from the capitalist mode of production to the mode of production of associated labor. Now, I'm not going to go further into that here because that argument comes up in the, the, the other chapter, and I'd like to talk more explicitly about, about that there. So, within this, there's one other sort of footnote, which is there on 744, 745, that the credit system, in the same way that it was used to, to milk wealth out of the peasantry, particularly on 745, when he talks about uh, about ten lines down, he says, it's plain enough that the working class is swindled in this form too, and to an enormous extent. But it is equally exploited by the petty trader who supplies the worker with means of subsistence. This is a secondary exploitation. So you also have to look at the way in which the credit system may kind of suck wealth uh, out of low-income populations, which it does. Uh, very, very swift. So that is another aspect of it. In chapter 28, uh, Marx talks about uh, the way money capital operates at both ends of the circulation process, loaning money to capitalists to uh, begin production, and at the same time loaning money to workers in order to create the effective demand to be able to buy the stuff. What power accrues to money capital by being able to work both sides? Dangerous power, <laughs> very dangerous power. Um, my example of that would be something like uh, uh, financiers uh, lend money to developers and construction interests and they build tract housing outside of San Diego somewhere. Uh, then the big question is who they're going to sell that to and the financiers lend money to people to buy it. So that's, this is a very good example of you know, financiers managing both the supply and demand uh, for tract uh, housing. And that can go on for a very long time until something goes wrong, that is they start lending to people who can't afford to pay back. But then there's an interesting kind of question, which do you think the finance was, would, prepare, would prefer to go bankrupt? The construction companies and the developers or the homeowners? Usually the bankers are in bed with the, with the construction interests of the developers and you know, they're very close friends and all this kind of stuff. So they don't want them to go bankrupt, so they'd rather bankrupt the people rather than the interests. So this is the kind of dynamic that you, you see going on there. But at the same time, the financial interests, if, the, if there's a lot of losses in the housing market, they can suffer uh, significantly from that unless they're insured against those losses, which of course many of them were, which is what happened in, in, the, in the, the, the sort of recent uh, 
collapse of uh, housing markets. Okay, I just want to uh, go through uh, chapter 27 and then, and then pause a little bit for some uh, discussion. Uh, chapter 27 is a very succinct chapter, but full of uh, ideas that we need to grapple with. Uh, the role of credit is, is, I mean, as he says, it's a necessary uh, formation to bring about the equalization of the profit rate. This is an extremely important function, obviously, and as again, I so is the, you know, money capital in its butterfly form and its credit form can flit around to find out whether wherever the rate of profit is highest and, and land there. But then it's the reduction of circulation costs. And also, uh, it's not only circulation costs uh, in uh, the next one, it's also about uh, time. So the credit system saves greatly on cost and time, and we've already been dealing with questions of cost and time, and we'll be going back into questions of cost and time in Volume 2. And you will recall in Volume 2 how often he was kind of saying, well, the credit system changes all of this, but, but, but clearly, uh, the credit system diminishes transaction costs in all sorts of ways. It diminishes the cost, he says, of money itself, because all you have to do is enter in a piece, you know, you don't need to be, even to make a banknote and all that sort of thing. And with electronic monies, you, you, you don't, it, it saves on, uh, on actually uh, dollar bills and things. Uh, and it accelerates and it allows the acceleration of, of, of monetary exchanges. So, reduction of cost and time uh, is of, of, of motion is, is terribly important, but again, we don't need to deal with that here because that's what we're dealing with in, in Volume 2. But then comes the third thing, the formation of joint stock companies. And we've already talked about this a little bit, uh, which uh, facilitates an, a tremendous expansion in the scale of production and enterprises which would be impossible for individual capitals. And at the same time, enterprises that were previously government ones become social. One of the theories we work with is a state usually bears the, the, the cost of very large infrastructural projects. But you can now associate capitals in such a way as you can build something like the Channel Tunnel, for example, a huge kind of project that in the past would have been funded mainly by state expenditures, but you can get a consortium of banks and consortium everything to uh, to take on something of that kind. But this implies, as he says, uh, the, the rise of a, of, of a social form of capital. And that, that point at the end of that paragraph on uh, 2, this is the abolition of capital as private property within the confines of the capitalist mode of production itself. This is a somewhat surprising statement. I, I mean, you know, I kind of go, wow. Um, it also transforms the actual functioning capitalist into a mere manager in charge of other people's capital, and of the capital owner into a mere owner, a mere money capitalist. And this is the point I was making about the, sto the historical story is, is the subservience of, of interest-bearing capital to the capitalist mode of production, and now we see you know, it's the money bearing, it's the money capitalist who's circulating it in this way, who becomes, as it were, uh, the, the owner, whereas the people who are engaging in production becomes, in a sense, just man managers and workers. And the result of this is that on 568 he talks away about the way in which profit appears, and no longer just the part of it, interest, that obtains its justification of the profit of the borrower, the profit thus appears as simply the appropriation of other people's surplus labour arising from the transformation of means of production into capital. In joint stock companies, the function is separated from capital ownership, so labour is almost completely separated from ownership of the means of production and of surplus labour. This result of capitalist production and its highest development is a necessary point of transition towards the transformation of capital back into the property of the producers, though no longer as the private property of individual producers, but rather as their property as associated producers, as directly social property. Then there's a little bit about, uh, which I, I find rather important for very particular reasons, but doesn't really 
enter into the debate here very much. Before we go on, he says, the following economically important fact must be noted. noted. Since profit here simply assumes a form of interest, enterprises that merely yield an interest are possible. Uh, and this is one of the reasons that hold, hold up the fall in the general rate of profit. We've argued before that in fixed capital that you could have a machine like a forklift truck and you could lend it out just for interest. Right? So you, instead of lending money, you lend a, a thing, a commodity. But you could also produce it simply to earn interest. And this happens with the built environment a lot. That what you're interested in, sorry for the pun, but your interest is interest. And and this also in the built case of the built environment, there's a, an overlap with the question of rent, and the relationship between rent and interest. And in a way, rent becomes a form of interest when you produce built environment. Now, what this means is that when you rent the forklift truck, you're not paying for it at its full value. You're paying for it as you know, the, the constant and variable capital plus that portion of the surplus value, which is interest only. In other words, you're save, you, you don't need the other part, which is the surplus value going as profit. And as a result of that, the forklift truck is cheaper. And if the forklift truck is an, is, is an input into your production, you've got means of production, constant capital, at a cheaper rate than you would otherwise get it. And in uh, the theory of uh, uh, political economy laid out in, say, the French Communist Parties and uh, Party in the end of the 60s, early 1970s, they pointed to the fact that a lot of capital was now circulating just in, just in search of interest. And that this, therefore, was one of the reasons why the profit rate was not falling as fast as it should. So this, became, this, this little paragraph became a kind of piece of dogma within the French Communist Party as to how to explain why the rate of profit wasn't falling as much as it, sh as much as it should. But Marx is after, you know, and Engels gives some further kind of commentary on, on, on things, but Marx's final paragraph on 569, this is the abolition of the capitalist mode of production within the capitalist mode of production itself, and hence a self-abolishing contradiction which presents itself prima facie as a mere point of transition to a new form of production. It presents itself as such a contradiction even in appearance. It gives rise to monopoly in certain spheres and hence provokes state intervention. It reproduces a new financial aristocracy, a new kind of parasite in the guise of company promoters, speculators and merely nominal directors. An entire system of swindling and cheating with respect to the promotion of companies, issue of shares and share dealings. It is private production unchecked by private ownership. And then on the next page he keeps on going, the actual capital um, that someone possesses or is taken to possess by public opinion now becomes simply the basis for a superstructure of credit. And instead of uh, the, the, the capitalist saving, uh, they actually have to depend very much on others saving for him, uh, which gives the lie to this notion that capitalists actually abstain from consumption. They don't, they just borrow. Somebody else's, other people save and they then take it and then use it. So they don't have to abstain at all, they can in fact, you know, the whole kind of theory of abstinence which was mocked in some ways in volume one now gets its uh, final comeuppance in the credit system. But Another thing that happens is that there is expropriation which starts to go on uh, and in a way what the credit system permits is a certain cannibalization of certain parts of the, of the capitalist class by other parts. Uh, and on top of 571 he says expropriation now extends from the immediate producers to the small and medium capitalists themselves. Expropriation is the starting point of the capitalist mode of production whose goal is to carry it through to completion and even in the last instance to expropriate all individuals from the means of production. Within the capitalist system itself, this expropriation takes the antithetical form of the appropriation of social property by a few. And then he talks about since ownership now exists in the form of shares, 
Its movement and transfer become simply the result of stock exchange dealings where little fishes are gobbled up by the sharks and sheep by the stock exchange wolves. In the joint stock system there is already a conflict with the old form in which the means of social production appear as individual property. But the transformation into the form of shares still remains trapped within the capitalist barriers. Instead of overcoming the opposition between the character of wealth as something social and private wealth, this transformation only develops this opposition in a new form. Then we get into the question of cooperative factories, run by workers themselves, are within the old form the first examples of the emergence of a new form, that is the socialization of production on a more democratic basis. But the opposition between capital and labour is abolished here, even if at first only in the form that the workers in association become their own capitalist, i.e. they use the means of production to valorize their own labour. These factories show how at a certain stage of development of the material forces of production and of the social forms of production corresponding to them, a new mode of production develops and is formed naturally out of the old. Naturally. Without the factory system that arises from the capitalist mode of production, cooperative factories could not develop. This is Marx's argument about the progressive side of capital is to produce something which can then be appropriated by the collective labourers but if they had not produced it, it couldn't be appropriated. So, Nor could they do so without the credit system that develops from the same mode of production. This credit system, since it forms a principal basis for the gradual transformation of capitalist private enterprise into capitalist joint stock companies, presents in the same way the means for the gradual extension of cooperative enterprises on a more or less national scale. Capitalist joint stock companies, as much as cooperative factories, should be viewed as transition forms from the capitalist mode of production to the associated one. Simply that in the one case the opposition is abolished in a negative way and in the other a positive way. And then he goes on to talk about how credit system appears as a principal lever of overproduction, excessive speculation in commerce, it forces the system to its extreme limit, and this is because a great part of the social capital is applied by those who are not its owners who therefore proceed quite unlike owners who, when they function themselves, anxiously weigh the limits of their private capital. So the barriers that exist, he suggests, are constantly broken through by the credit system. So that the credit system, end of the paragraph, accelerates the violent outbreaks of this contradiction, crises, and with these the elements of dissolution of the old mode of production. So what he sees here is the, the idea that the credit system has this dual character immanent in it. On the one hand it develops the motive of capitalist production, enrichment by the exploitation of others' labour, into the purest and most colossal system of gambling and swindling, and restricts ever more the already small number of the exploiters of social wealth, producing a plutocracy of the sort we have around us today. On the other hand, however, it constitutes the form of transition towards a new mode of production. It is this dual character that gives the principal spokesman for credit from law through Isaac Perrier, the nicely mixed character of swindler and prophet. What do you make of this? Yeah. I, mean, I think this assumes that the factories that have been created in capitalism are the factories that we want and can continue to use. You know, we, I don't know if we want you know, factories that are uh, extracting coal or burning coal. Or you don't want power? <laughs> is the other sorts, right? And not the sorts that have already been created. Yeah, but you know, if you have sorts of another sort, then you know, you've still got to have a factory or something to make them. You know, I mean, I, I get what you're saying, and that the transition to socialism just cannot take over the technologies and organizational form and everything, sort of, and just say, oh, it's all okay. But I think the principle he's talking about is that that there is an organization of production there, and there is a credit system that is. Uh, enables you to actually expropriate. I mean, small capital is being expropriated by big capital, so why can't the credit system be used to expropriate the big ones? You know, and, and why can't that be done on a collective basis? Yeah. And, and I think it's definitely also, I mean, I think that the human had an implicitly referring to overnight cooperative factories, which I understand everywhere. Yeah. The industries of labor. Yeah. We see in the factory occupations, uh, periodically, people take over the factory and, 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 and do it on a communal basis. Um, I mean, do you think he's just being optimistic here, or...? or, or 
or uh, crazy. I mean, I mean, he certainly lived in a world where, for instance, the uh, Robert Owen kind of notion of worker-controlled factories and so on was 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 a very strong option, and and to some degree they were working. Although, you know, there were problems. I mean, it comes back again and again to this notion of associated labor is going to be the form of that socialism takes. And how do you bring associated labor into being? And he seems here to think that there is an opportunity. Now, it may have been a historical opportunity at his particular moment. Now, some people who argue at that particular moment, back in the 1850s and 1860s, uh, the possibility of doing something like this was really there, and we could argue, well, right now that possibility no longer exists, it's gone, you know, I mean, but, yeah. There's kind of a tra uh, tradition within Marx, like Frankfurt School, for example, to say that uh, at, to this point, socialist tradition would say that uh, this central organization of, uh, of the associated labor would be already the transition to an emancipated society, to socialism, but then they would say it might be a necessary but not a sufficient condition of that, because uh, if you get state capitalism out of that, you just have the same old ruling classes with a much stronger grip of power organized not only centrally but with <coughs> power states themselves, and the centralization itself of associated labor doesn't lead to uh, the abolition of the mode of production just a stronger force. So I think in that point, democracy comes as an important question in some sense. And I think Marx wasn't expecting that there could be this combination of mass democracy with uh, capitalism, and then when it came, it brought out this even more powerful ruling class. But his, but his. His commentary here is that this happens naturally. I mean, there's no political party that's organizing this. There's no uh, conquest of state power that's going to support it. I mean, that's not what he's saying. He's saying that it naturally arises. Uh, and we have certainly seen in some situations where uh, factories have been taken over and, you know, converted. Um, and uh, that associated labor uh, has at various points organized itself uh, to do you know to do things of this of this kind now this you know you may argue well that's not sufficient there it's only you know we need to we need to think about a broader basis of any kind of transition but uh, is this does this sound like a reasonable kind of form that we would think of. Yeah. Well, what astonishes me is that he deals with the credit system and with the cooperatives at the same, yeah. on the same level. I, know. I mean, in our common sense, the cooperatives are something good, the credit system is something bad, in that value judgment and in common sense. For him, it's on the same level. And, my, I, and it's difficult to imagine for me how he, ima how he imagined the transition from the credit system to a, a socialist kind of mode of production. But maybe the idea is that if we had a public banking system, a public credit system, that could be put to the service of cooperatives, uh, to cooperatives, that this would be a, a combination that, that uh, could uh, be a part of the tradition. i go back to the example I mentioned before, which would be Mondragon. Okay which is not only producing things in factories, uh, it has a credit institution. It also has retail outlets, and they have something like 200, and as I think I mentioned, you know, the ratio of, re of returns that the shareholders, i.e. the workers, hold, and it's interesting. You know, when he's talking about Saint-Simon, Saint-Simon kept on calling the, he kept on calling the them workers, but it really what he was talking about was was the artisan producers, you know, and 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 petty bourgeois uh, individuals, and so uh, 
So, so you find something like that in Mondragon. Now, what, what is interesting to me about Mondragon is the left criticism of Mondragon is, ironically, in relationship to what Marx is saying here, that they act like joint stock companies. <laughs> but Mondragon is the longest lasting worker cooperative that exists in the world, and it's, it's successful and it's growing. But left critics say, uh, well, yeah, it's very well, it's very nice for them, but well, they make a number of criticisms, so, but one of them is it acts like a corporation. And I, I, I find it very interesting that you know, Marx kind of says, well, corporations can act like... <laughs> I, there's, there's, some, there's some peculiar overlap here that I'm not quite sure how, how to think about, how to handle. And let's, and let's face it, you know, I mean, we can have visions of socialism and all this kind of stuff all over the place, and all kinds of visions, and I like to have them and, 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 and that, but on the other hand, if you want to, want to get there, you've got to think of some way to do it. And Marx kind of is seizing upon this possibility and saying, well, this has some possibilities, and it can go two ways. It can either go in this direction of an immense system of swindling and gambling and all this kind of stuff. I don't think anybody would deny that it's gone in that direction historically, but he's saying there was, a historic, there was at a certain moment a historical choice, and it went the wrong way, and we can say well, it went the wrong way, or we can say, well, there is perpetual possibilities here about going in another way. That is, uh, you know, covering the earth with Mondragons, you know, or something, you know, which, which would be a joint stock, would indeed have a, a bit the form of associated capitals, but it, except it would be under worker control. Now, if you say that to a lot of uh, people on the left these days, they'll, you know, I mean, well, I won't go into what they'll say to you, but they'll probably say some very negative things to you. Because, you know, you, 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 uh, you want some sort of corporate form like that. I, I don't know, I, I don't know quite how much of the left thinks of Mondragon, actually. It's very interesting to find out. But you had a... You know, and with the Argentinian factory takeovers, that's what they ran up against immediately was a lack of credit, which is why it was a small one that had to survive. Um, but it's, they're still, you know, subject even the successful ones and the Mondragon to the coercive laws of capitalism. <coughs> you know, and the question is, can they super? Are they willing to super exploit, uh, uh, exploit themselves to engage in, in those, uh, you know, production of the accumulation of surplus value where they can compete against the capitalist firms? Um, they're, they're still investing <coughs> in the market, and you know, we, we don't want to fall in the trap that. Nothing can change until everything can change, but there's a problem of socialism yeah. on one island, or socialism in one factory. This phrase, though, is the abolition of the capitalist mode of production within the capitalist. It's a very interesting phrase. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know quite what to make of it. A self-dissolving contradiction. You know, when he says things like that, I kind of, kind of, what, what does this actually mean? And I can't, I can't quite figure out what he means by it. Uh, but it's, uh, I mean, there's, there's, something, there's something about this, this, this chapter I find, I find intriguing. I don't know if the rest of you do. I mean, I, I, it, 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 it poses some, some interesting kinds of ideas. I mean, I agree with you. I mean, this naturally, and it seems like, you know, there is a teleological, even in the, the historical chapter, there tends to be a, somewhat of a teleological manner of presentation, that this is where it's going to go. Though here, you know, there is that bifurcation, you know, and, and, and clearly it went down the swindling, gambling track, uh, you know, but could it have gone down another track? And, but, you know, historically, worker cooperatives have failed uh, to accomplish the transition to capitalism. Well, then there's also one, you know, capitalists as a class will yes. cooperate to destroy yes. any alternative. And state power will be used, and all kinds of other things will be used, and credit, and the credit, if you don't have your own credit system, then that, that'll be, you know, which is why Mondrian Gone has its own credit system, so probably you need your own credit system in order to, to survive. I mean, that's what that would say. Yeah. Marx always practices a methodology to look for the new elements in the old system. Yeah. That's what he. That's why he criticizes right. utopianism. Yep. It's not to create a complete alternative vision in an abstract way, but to identify these elements. And that's that's his method. But I think when he then really talks about and thinks about revolution, then he includes the problem of the state, not 
not just credit system plus cooperative, but what what what, what about the power in the state in in the event of this game? Which is absent. I mean, I think in some ways, actually, you know, Marx had a very complicated relationship with the utopians of the period. And he generally dissed them all of the time, you know, and said they were. But he drew a lot from them. I mean, I think he drew a lot more from Fourier than he really ever acknowledges. And I suspect he's here drawing from Saint Simon in ways that are not uh, readily acknowledged, which is why he kind of says, well, half of Simon is, you know, Saint Simon is right, you know. That the Pereiras were half right, you know, they were part the prophet of the new system, but they're also swindlers, you know, so. The next two chapters, I'm not going to be concerned with them uh, uh, in too much detail. They're mainly uh, about what, what happens uh, in, the, in the banking system and what the role of banks uh, is in this whole system. There's a, a, a system that he seems to be setting up, I've mentioned sort of several times, if you just take the, the basic circulation of money, buying uh, labor power and means of production, going into production with a, and then this system, what, what he's now looking at here is, um, and before we have a kind of a, uh, a credit system, which is up here, but now he's looking very explicitly at the banking part of the credit system. So what do the banks do? But the general argument he's making, as you remember last time, I, I said, well, the, the, the credit system does two things. First, it, it, it lends money. So loans flow this way. Uh, then, so it lends to production, but it also lends to realization. So by discounting, bills of exchange. So this system, at some point, generates a flow where, you know, he started off by kind of saying the credit system had to be disciplined to this so that it performed properly. But what we now start to see is, is a relationship in which there's a sort of peculiar kind of circulation process in which the banks circulate their capital through this, into this system and draw interest and money out of it. So in a way, they suck a part of the surplus value produced in the system back up in here in return for these two functions. They do this and they do this, but they also get a flow of surplus value back. And over time, it appears as if they are the genuine owners. And everything that goes on here is just a sort of managerial function. This is again part of the argument in this earlier chapter. So now he looks at this, this flow and kind of says, well, look, what is money doing here? And he, he objects very much to the general idea of the time that there was a difference between capital and currency. And he says, well, you know, they said, well, there's, there's you know, Overton and people like that said, well, there's, 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 there's capital, which is, uh, and then there's currency. And Marx says, no, there's only one money. But money has different functions. And the banks, when they're doing this, are doing something very different from when they're doing their, their lending for realization. Here, you're likely to see the banks facilitating this process by, by providing cash to facilitate. So what Marx kind of says, what this generates here is, at this end, we have something called, which is, which is the circulation of revenues, which is uh, the, you know, a whole set of uh, purchases which go on as, as laborers uh, purchase goods, as capitalists purchase goods to consume, something like that. So circulation of revenues, and, and this end we've got circulation of, of capital. 
So he kind of says there are two circulation processes here, but they're intertwined with each other. That is, you, you couldn't have the circulation of revenues without generating the revenues out of paying wages to labour, and capitalists consuming things, and then buying things. So the circulation of revenues and the circulation of capital is the relevant distinction. And the banks provide financing to both of those. But the financing stream is rather different. And then he starts to talk about the relationships that happen when, I don't know, there's some problem in the circulation of revenues which then blocks this and then what happens to the loans that come in here, so then there's this kind of notion of how if there's any blockage anywhere within this system, certain crises can occur. So he's very much interested in these chapters in looking at the role of banking, uh, of the banks specifically, intervening in the circulation of capital and intervening in the circulation of revenues. And those are the relevant uh, distinctions, he feels, which have not been uh, really taken up uh, in, the right kind of, in the right kind of way. Uh, and in, in, in chapter uh, 29, he starts to get into a lot of, uh, I think, uh, interesting aspects, which is, what is the nature of the capital, that is, the bank's capital? How is their capital circulating, and, and, and what is its circulation about? And this is one of the better chapters for actually getting a grasp on fictitious capital. So on 594, he starts, Banking capital, he says, consists of one, cash in the form of gold or notes, two, securities. And these latter may be divide, again be divided into two parts, commercial paper, current bills of exchange that fall due on specified dates, their discounting being the specific business of the banker, and public securities, such as government bonds, treasury bills and stocks of all kinds, in short, interest-bearing paper, which is essentially different from bills of exchange. Mortgages, too, could be included in this category. The capital which has these as its tangible component parts can also be broken down into the banker's own invested capital and deposits that form his banking or borrowed capital. Notes must also be added here in the case of banks which have the right to issue them. So he then says, well, I'll leave that all aside. But then, about the middle of the next page, he starts to say the following. This, he says, of, uh, of, of these transactions, is a purely illusory notion. Let us take the national debt and wages as examples. The state has to pay its creditors a certain sum of interest each year for the capital it borrows. In this case, the creditor cannot recall his capital from the debtor, but can only sell the claim, his title of ownership. The capital itself has been consumed, spent by the state. It no longer exists. And then right at the bottom there, the last three lines, the capital from which the state's payment is taken as deriving as interest is illusory and fictitious. It is not only that the sum that was lent to the state no longer has any kind of existence, it was never designed to be spent as capital to be invested. And yet only by being invested as capital could it have been made into self-maintaining value. And then he goes, before the end of the paragraph, the capital of the national debt remains purely fictitious. You've seen that place where they put up the national debt, right? I don't know, the figures are going like this. Uh. And the moment these promissory notes become unsaleable, the illusion of this capital disappears. Yet this fictitious capital has its characteristic movement for all that, as we shall see soon. U.S. Treasuries are a form of fictitious capital. They're not invested, uh, yeah, they're, not, they're not circulating and making, making surplus value. They're just a claim on some of the revenue of the state. Moving from the capital of the national debt, where a negative quantity appears as capital, interest-bearing capital always being the mother of every insane form, so that debts, for example, can appear as commodities in the mind of the banker, we should now consider labour power. And then he, there's this thing that they tried to turn uh, labour into a form of human capital. And then he deals with the question on 597. The formation of fictitious capital is known as capitalization. Any regular periodic income can be capitalized by reckoning it up on the basis of the average rate of interest as the sum that a capital lent out at this interest rate would yield. For example, if the annual income is 100, rate of interest 5%, then 100 is the annual interest on 2,000 pounds. 
in this way all connection with the actual process of capital's valorization is lost, right down to the last trace, confirming the notion that capital is automatically valorized by its own powers. What you'd exchange is, 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 is claims, is titles to claims. That's what goes on in a stock exchange. Uh, you have a claim on the income, the future income of a firm. If they don't produce anything, your claim is worthless. But nevertheless, the value can oscillate all over the place, as it does on the stock exchange. The independent movement, he says on 598, of these ownership titles' values, not only of the, those of government bonds but also of shares, strengthens the illusion that they constitute real capital besides the capital or claim to which they may give title. We're halfway down, the market value of these securities is partly speculative, since it is determined not just by the actual revenue, but rather by the anticipated revenue as reckoned in advance. And then he goes on to about, you know, the fact that also, of course, you can get depreciation of, of values on 599, their depreciation of crisis is a powerful means of centralizing money wealth. And this depreciation can occur even though the railway is still there and the canal traffic, as he says on 599, and he starts to talking about the bursting of these soap bubbles by nominal money uh, capital. So, in this chapter we get a lot about fictitious capital, and what we see is that the, the banks are, for the large part, trading in fictitious capital. So on 600, he's again being very explicit, middle of the page, he says, the greater part of bankers' capital is therefore purely fictitious, and consists of claims, bills of exchange, and shares, drafts on future revenues. It should not be forgotten here that this capital's money value, as represented by these papers in the banker's safe, is completely fictitious even insofar as they are drafts on certain assured revenues, as with government securities, or ownership titles to real capital, as with shares, their money value being determined differently from the value of the actual capital that, that they at least partially represent or where they represent only a claim to revenue and not capital at all, the claim to the same revenue is expressed in a constantly changing, fictitious money capital. Now, as I argued last time, the category of fictitious capital is terribly important in Marx. It has a very important role to play, and, and it's not imaginary in the sense, you know, it's, it's illusory, but nevertheless it's very real. I mean, the stock market is a real, is a real entity. It's, it's exchanging all of these titles. Uh, and the result of this, as he says on 601, in the middle, the greater part of this money capital is purely fictitious. Then, of course, <coughs> poses the question, which you know I started out in the first part talking about, which is what's the relationship uh, between this fictitious capital and and the speculative activity and, and and real capital, which he takes up in the next chapter, which is uh, chapter 30 on 607. The only difficult questions which we are now coming on to in connection with the credit system as follows. Firstly, the accumul accumulation of money capital as such. How far is it and how far is it not? An index of genuine capital accumulation is the phenomenon of a plethora of capital, an expression used only of interest-bearing capital, simply a particular expression of industrial overproduction, or does it form a separate phenomenon alongside this? Does such a plethora or an oversupply of money capital coincide with the presence of stagnant sums of money, so that this excess of, natural, of actual money is an expression and form of appearance? And secondly, he's going on further, we have to look uh, to what extent does monetary scarcity affect things, and then also to what degree uh, does money capital and money wealth in general uh, reduce itself to the accumulation of proprietary claims to labour? And the weird thing is, he says, towards the bottom, of, right on the bottom of the, in the next page of 607, in the way that even an accumulation of debts can appear as an accumulation of capital. We see the distortion involved in the credit system reaching its cul cul culmination, reach its culmination. These promissory notes which were issued for a capital originally borrowed but long since spent, these paper, paper duplicates of annihilated capital, function for their owners as capital insofar as they are saleable commodities and can therefore be transformed back into capital. So you have ownership titles to joint stock companies, railways, mines, etc., yet they give no control over this capital. The capital cannot be withdrawn. They give only a legal claim 
to a share of the surplus value. But these titles similarly become paper duplicates of the real capital as if a bill of lading simultaneously acquired a value alongside the cargo it refers to. And they talked earlier about some of the ways in which uh, actually uh, merchants would sell uh, a cargo twice. They would sell the bill of exchange on it, get the money for it, and then they would actually sell it, the cargo, to somebody. So the cargo disappeared. And then, you know, this happened between India and Britain, you know, and, and they'd, have, they, they'd have the money on the bill of exchange from the bank, and they'd walk off with the money, and then they sold the, the, the cargo in India, and then when it never got to Britain, they kind of say, well, it got lost en route, it sank at sea or something, you know. <laughs> Not my fault, I just, you know, so the bank was left, you know, and they got the money. So all this swindling goes on in this way, you would sell, sell the same thing three or four times, like, you know, I guess you sell the Brooklyn Bridge and a few things like that. What Marx is doing here is, is analysing this notion of uh, fictitious capital and who is engaging in this trading in fictitious capital and non-existent capitals. And he comes to, I think, a, a point we should acknowledge, which is that on page 609 he starts to talk uh, about that the intermediaries between the private money capitalists on the one hand and the state, local authorities and borrowers engaged in the process of reproduction on the other, and he talks about these intermediaries, that arises with the in immense extension of the credit system, that this is exploited by the bankers as their private capital. And these fellows have their capital and revenue permanently in the f money form or in the form of direct claims to money. The accumulation of wealth by this class, notice he's using the term class about them, may proceed in a very different way from that of actual accumulation, but it proves in any case that they put away a good proportion of the latter. Of course, this is one of the complaints about the contemporary banking system, uh, that they're putting away vast amounts of uh, uh, wealth which is being generated in society for their own particular good without doing anything, and they can do this because their manner of accumulation is radically different from that which is going on here. In other words, there is a mode of accumulation going on here in which you can suck dry, <coughs> basically, most of the accumulation, of, most of the surplus value here, simply in terms of the class of bankers. And I think there's no question whatsoever that in our particular time the class of bankers is very powerful and has the ability to suck out a vast amount of the wealth. I mean, just look at their bonuses and all the rest of it and you see uh, how they're doing it, and therefore very, very difficult to get control of them. The only other thing I think which is very significant in this, uh, well there are several aspects of this chapter which I think are significant, but one of them uh, erupts around uh, 614, where Marx is uh, talking here about the role of credit in the reproduction, the role of banking capital in the reproduction system in general, and the relationship to disturbances in the system uh, and this sort of temporal discussion of the way in which uh, banking capital in particular has a role to play in the, in the business cycle, if you want. So that this page, I think, is worthwhile uh, taking a, a, a good look at, with the way in which, uh, as he says at the bottom, factories stand idle, raw materials pile up, finished products flood the market as commodities. Nothing could be more wrong, therefore, than to ascribe such a situation to a lack of productive capital. It's precisely then that there is a surplus of productive capital, partly in relation to the normal, though temporarily contracted, scale of reproduction, and partly in relation to the crippled consumption. What this suggests is that the circulation of revenues is broken down for some reason, and in this case we have a, a crisis which he follows through on the next page in the following way. In this case, he says, a crisis would be explicable only in terms of a disproportion in production between different branches and a disproportion between the consumption of the capitalists themselves and their accumulation. And this notion of disproportionality is going to come back in volume two when we get, when we get back into the heart of it. But as things actually are, the replacement of the capitals invested in production depends to a large extent on the consumption capacity of the non-productive classes while the consumption capacity of the workers is restricted partly by the laws governing wages and partly by the fact that they are employed only as long as they can be employed at a profit for the capitalist class. The ultimate reason for all real crises always remains the poverty and restricted consumption of the masses in the face of the drive of capitalist production to develop the productive forces as if only the absolute consumption capacity of society set a limit to them. I've always already, already mentioned that in, in Volume 2 we're frequently going to find one of the barriers to 
the accumulation of capital is going to be the restrictive consumption of the masses, the restrictive consumption of the working classes itself. And here he's, I think, uh, actively taking up uh, that question. Now the only other thing that I would want to uh, point out uh, is that there are passages in here uh, where Marx talks about um, the way in which the credit system plays a very important role in the geographical expansion of the system and the creation of the world market. And this is, I think, uh, again, coming back to that argument, I make, you know, the, the money form of capital is the most highly mobile form of capital, and because of that, uh, it, it has the capacity to move over space more easily than other forms of capital, and that therefore uh, the credit system is absolutely crucial uh, to uh, the world, the formation of the world market, and uh, the overcoming of space uh, through time, as Marx calls it. Um, there are several sentences in, in here where he talks about uh, the formation of the world market and the role of the credit system in that, and that the accumulation of capital and space and time is, is, is again organized through the central nervous system of uh, capital accumulation, so that therefore, uh, as you get towards the end of these, all these sections which we don't have time to look at, and in any case, a large part are somewhat incomprehensible, um, that uh, we get into the uh, international, uh, the last part is pressure, precious metal and rate of exchange, and it's the last chapter again. Uh, it, it's, not, it, it, it's not very easy to follow, but the uh, point about the formation of the world market becomes rather crucial to this, and the payment system between nations uh, becomes uh, bound up with the, with the credit system. But the main thing I'd like you to draw from this is one of the reasons I think Marx didn't want to insert all of this stuff into volume two uh, is because it really messes up uh, a lot of the nature of the argument that he wanted to construct in pristine form without having to deal with this really messy stuff. Uh, at the same time as he acknowledged that you really couldn't deal with things like turnover times and all the rest of it without <coughs> acknowledging the role of the credit system inside of it. But here we see, uh, it, it's sort of interesting uh, to see how the circuit of money capital, uh, when it becomes, takes this form, starts almost to look as if it is, it went from a situation of subservience into a position of dominance. And, and this, this, this is sort of rather, rather troubling for uh, the analysis. Uh, because, as, as he's said many, many times, you know, interest is a particularity, uh, it's regulated by supply and demand, which are particularities, and it's regulated by competition, and besides there's a lot of craziness and insane forms which are going on here, which make it very difficult to predict the dynamic of, of how the system is working. So you can see why he kept it out at the same time as you can see is when you introduce it into the Volume 2 analysis, you would end up with a rather different kind of uh, reading of what the actual dynamic of a capitalist society looks like. Because here we're closer to the actual dynamic, and in particular uh, this tension between a credit system which must be created in order to break through all of the barriers, and a credit system that is perpetually ex uh, escaping disciplinary, any kind of disciplinary power uh, to keep it under control and therefore engages in all of these speculative fevers. The last point I would like, like to make is that the theory of crisis in Marx, you know, is hotly debated amongst Marxists, but I think there's absolutely no question from these chapters that, that uh, the credit system in itself uh, has a very important autonomous role in, in, in crisis formation. And when he's talking about 1847-48 and he's talking about the crisis, it looks and sounds very much like a pure financial and commercial crisis. Uh, not, I mean, there's some notion that it's, it's triggered by over possible disproportionalities in here, overproduction or something like that, but the mechanics of it, at least, on the surface are certainly worked out and, and certainly filtered through the existence of these fictitious forms, that you therefore cannot analyze a crisis without recognizing the fetish character. Of, of, of the money form and particularly the credit form. 
And the fetish character is terribly, terribly important. And as he says about fetishism, it's not unreal, it's very real, and we have to deal with the reality of it. And I think that there are some interesting hints in here as to how, how, how to really work through the nature of a, a, a financial crisis and understand some of its dynamics, uh, which of course is something that is very important for us to do at this, this time. So we'll leave it here. Next time <coughs> we get back into Volume 2, and we do <coughs> chapters uh, 12, 13, and 14 from Volume 2. Okay?